Welcome to my gem talk on diamonds. Of all the gemstones in the world, arguably, diamonds is the most expensive. It is the most valuable, the most sought after, uh, the most coveted, and the most famous. I mean, literally every jewelry store in the world has at least a few pieces of diamond jewelry. Uh, diamonds have adorned kings and queens since the uh, dawn of time, but really most cut diamonds that we know of Started about 2,000 years ago, that would have been in India when they realized that um, they could take two diamond crystals and they would rub them together. It was the only way to cut these stones. They were extremely, extremely, extremely hard. So what is diamond? Diamond is, its chemical composition is carbon. It's pure carbon. It, it has no other element to it. Um, and the difference between a diamond and let's say charcoal is the way the carbon is bonded and the way that it crystallizes. Diamonds crystallize, there's seven crystal systems that all things crystallize in. They either crystallize in one or the other, it can't be two. The only one that's singly refractive is what we call the isometric crystal system or the cubic crystal system, which is what diamond crystallizes. And then singly refractive means that when a light goes in, it's bent, but it exits as one single beam. All the other six crystal systems, when the light exit, they split off into various beams. They call that double refraction. Diamond is not like that. I think that's one reason that adds to its the crispness that you see when you look into a diamond is because it is singly refractive. It, it, it really is a great stone. Now, what makes it so tough? Why are diamonds the hardest thing in the world? By far. You know, diamonds are 163 times harder than corundum, which is, which is a sapphire or ruby. They're extremely hard. That's why they use it for industrial purposes. It, it cuts through anything. That's because of the way they're bonded. At the molecular level, diamonds are what we call covalently bonded. So I want you to imagine a diamond a molecule is like a perfect cube, like a cube that a kid has, you know, four-sided or eight-sided. Now, at the corner of each cube is, 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 a, is a molecule. It, it, there's a diamond atom. These atoms share electrons. That's what covalent means, the valence. The, the, the outer rim of that diamond, there's electrons and they share it. All other, all other um, crystals of gemstones are what we call ionically bonded. So it means that one electron from one atom, it's being given up to the other one, so it loses one. When things are ionically bonded, they're not as tough. They can be broken apart. So the, the electromagnetic bond is much weaker. With diamond, the electromagnetic bond is unbelievably strong. And that is why diamond is so hard. Now, what is hardness? Hardness is measured or defined as a resistance to surface scratching, which means if I take steel or even if I take sapphire and I can take a diamond and I can try to scratch it as much as I can, nothing will happen to it. It will not scratch the surface. The only thing that will hurt a diamond is another diamond. The only thing that will scratch it. So it's very, very, very hard. Now, you've often heard of people breaking their diamonds or so-and-so chipped their diamond. They put an insurance claim for that. Diamonds can break. Now, you're saying, we just told me that it was hard. Well, hardness and toughness are two different properties. So diamonds form in what we call the octahedron crystal. It's just like, you know the pyramid? Imagine another one, uh, the reverse image of a pyramid. It's like two pyramids, one stuck on top of another at the base. That's the raw crystal of a diamond. So if we hit a diamond or go against a grain, so imagine this is the side of the pyramid, the octahedron crystal. We go like this, nothing happens to it. It's virtually indestructible. But if we go parallel, if we go in the same direction as the face of that crystal from an angle, guess what happens? Look, the tweezer goes right through it, okay? It's a directional property, so it's almost like a book. It forms in sheets. You go against the sheets, you can't do it, right? But if you go with the sheets, even with my finger, I can separate the pages. And that is how you can split a diamond. Matter of fact, for big diamond crystals, they'll actually cleave them. They'll They'll crack them apart, and they'll have what we call the cleavage plane. Now, all gemstones have a cleavage plane, but diamonds are no different. And that's because they form in sheets, like in layers. But they're still unbelievably tough. So where do they form? They form in the earth, obviously, but they don't form like other gemstones. They don't form in the crust. We have the earth. We have a thin layer. We call that the crust. That's what we live on, you know? Below the crust, there's something called the mantle. That's where diamonds form. They form deep 
deep, deep below the crust in what we call the Earth's mantle. Peridots form the same way. So how do they get to the surface? It's through volcanic activity. So the host rock, we call it kimberlite, also known as blue ground. And the diamonds will embed themselves in that blue ground and they will come to the surface through volcanic activity. As they come to the surface through volcanic activity, they get knocked around. They become smaller. That is primarily the reason why we see so many small diamonds and not many, many big diamonds. That's because they are travelers. They have to travel a long distance. Any stone, even sapphire, they form up in a mountain. By the time they get down to the valley, they become progressively smaller because they get knocked around. That's why we have these big quartzes. Quartzes are protected in an egg, right? They form in what we call a bug. And these bugs protect, or a geode, there's many different terms to use it, protect it, it's like an egg, and that's why Quartz forms so big, it doesn't move. It gets embedded in the basalt and it stays there until somebody discovers it, which is one reason why we see such big quartz crystals and you don't see that with diamonds. Uh, diamonds, where do they form? Uh, where are they found, I should say? Many different countries in the world. Up here in Canada, yes. Lots of diamonds in the Northern Territories. Also in Russia, also in the United States, in Brazil, in India, in Africa. Diamonds have been found in so many countries all around the world. So if they're so plentiful, why are they so expensive? Because they're controlled very cleverly uh, by a cartel. And everyone, even the Russians, if they're not part of the cartel, participate with the cartel. So it's almost like an agreed upon price. And uh, the way they do it, the very smart, is they estimate worldwide demand, let's say for 2021 at here, and they supply just below that demand. And uh, there's what we call site holders, people that have the um, privilege of going to buy rough diamonds. And they control the price by offering them a lot of diamonds, rough. They control the price, they set the price. And if you're a site holder, if you say no, you're never invited back. Basically, you're out of business. So this is how they set the price and can control it and make sure that diamond prices don't crash. And it's been very successful. Colored stones aren't like that. Colored stones are traded basically on supply and demand. So this is why you get hi higher prices and lower prices. They rise just with all the other commodities. But with diamonds, it is more controlled. And this is why we, um, we see the expenses, uh, expensive diamonds the way that we do. Diamonds are the preferred gemstone for engagement rings because you want your love to last forever. So this is why, you know, people say that diamonds last forever. And they kind of do. It's the only thing that you can buy that you can physically wear on your body every single day for your life. You can live to be 100. When you pass on, they can take your diamond, wash it in water, and your diamond will not have a single scratch on it. Unless, of course, it's been scratched by another diamond. There's nothing else you can buy in the world that you can physically use on a day-to-day -day basis that will not scratch other than a diamond. And it really, really is incredible. When I was an early gemologist and I, would, I was an appraiser, I was shown diamonds that were old mine-cut diamonds. Stuff from like 1900 didn't have a scratch on it. Why? Because it didn't come in contact with another diamond. So it really is, it's incredible that way. Um, diamonds are beautiful. They're very, very dispersive. They have a high refractive index. That's very important. Why do they appear so bright? There's many reasons. First of all, the refractive index is high. Light enters the stone. It's bent. The more it's bent, we call that a high refractive index. That is one thing that gives... Um, diamonds that brightness. It's because the, the light is bent, so therefore when we create pavilion facets at the bottom, it's very easy to redirect that light back up to your eye. Another thing is they're very dispersive. Here, I'll show you on the turnstile shot. And this will also lead to another thing. See how dispersive the stone is? Diamonds have a much, much higher dispersiveness than other materials. See all the colors of the rainbow that you're seeing there? That's called dispersion. White light is being broken up into its spectral hues, which is very, very, very um, important and adds to the, uh, the beauty of diamonds. Another very important thing about diamonds that most people don't realize is that diamonds reflect, the surface of a diamond will reflect 17% of white light. Glass will reflect less than 5% of white light. This is why 
when you buy a diamond, you can tolerate a diamond that's like, let's say an I1 or an I2 clarity, a lower clarity grade, because that sparkle that you see is actually the surface of the stone being reflected back up to your eye. So they call that scintillation, that reflection. Diamonds are four times more reflective than glass. So this is one reason that adds to the allure. So they have a very high scintillation factor, much higher than any other gemstone. So even when you get them dirty and all that, they still kind of sparkle. Well, that sparkle is actually the surface of the, of the material being reflected up to your eye. So those are very important properties of diamonds that everyone loves. Now, the diamond grading system, that was invented by GIA, which is an acronym for the Gemological Institute of America. They invented a grading system that spoke about the way that they're cut and the way that they're uh, the clarity and the color. They call that the four C's. So it is carat weight, which is how a diamond weight is measured. Okay, why is it called a carat? Because it's based on the ancient carob seed. And if you ever see carob seeds, each one is exactly the same size and same weight as the one next to it. They're unbelievably consistent. Consistence. So a carob or a carrot or a carob seed weighs one fifth of a gram, which basically means the five carob seeds weigh one gram. Very consistent. So in the ancient times, on, on balance scales, they used to use that to say how much those diamonds weigh. Let me use a carob seed because they were plentiful, they were easy, and they were very, very um, accurate. And that is how the term carrot became uh, available, and this is how we use it. So. Carrots is like we use a decimal system. So one carrot is 1.00. If I have half a carrot, I would have 0 0.50. The decimal system, I know it's math. No one likes math, but that is how we, we measure the weight of diamond. And sometimes we'll use the, the term points. The jewelry industry is strange because it uses different terms for the same thing. So um, carat weight are sometimes points. If somebody says that stone is 100 points, it means it's 1.00. If it's, it's three points, I mean point zero 0.03, or three parts of a hundred. So it's a way of measuring weight, and it's another term of expression. So the bigger the diamond is, the more valuable it is. Why? Because when they're mining diamonds, they mostly find little stones. To get a big diamond, they don't find them that often. So when they do, the price goes up because uh, there's always a higher demand than there is supply. With quartz, big quartz, plentiful, right? With diamond, it's not like that. So that's one of the C's. The other one is cut. And this is one that everyone ignores. And I want to show you here what I have on my turnstile. You'll often hear me say that, you know, the diamonds that we use at Gem de Vogue are full cut. Full cut refers to this cut here. It's 58 facets. You see how much more it sparkles much higher to a much higher degree? Okay. That's because all these extra facets over here work like a mirror and they redirect light back up to the viewer which is you so you get more dispersion you get more color play it appears brighter so why doesn't everyone do that well every time i cut a facet into a stone i lose material because i'm cutting it right i lose material when it comes to small crystals of diamonds especially where there are two or three points the real small ones that we get in side stones they're usually cut into single cuts. This is 17 facet. Do you see how it appears to be duller? Well, it is. But when it's really, really small, a lot of people have a hard time telling the difference. The difference is there. And the difference can be seen if you really spend time to look at it. The reason that I use the full cuts is that I think they're much more superior. Big stones are cut this way. And uh, the best jewelry stores in the world use full cuts or round brilliant cuts for all their cutting. So why would people bother to use the single cuts? The main reason is cost. Let me explain to you. When you're mining a diamond, a small diamond, the biggest cost factor is not the crystal, it's not mining it. It's cutting it. You see, it takes, to cut a one carat diamond, it takes 100 hours. Diamonds are extremely, extremely hard. The cutting process is not quick. Because the only thing that can cut a diamond is another diamond. And they use diamond dust, and I'm going to get into that soon. So the process to cut a one carat diamond takes 100 hours. Now, it's quicker to, color, to cut a smaller diamond, but they still need about a day to do it. It's a long time to cut a little tiny stone. So if I only have to do 17 facets, 
versus 58 facets, I can cut that down into half a day. And that's where I save my money. That's why all the small stones that you see out there are all single cuts and no one will ever tell you that, that you're only seeing single cuts. And, and that's the reason they're trying to save money because the cost of cutting is very high. That's one of the trade secrets of the, of the gem industry that no one ever, ever speaks about. I'm gonna get into how stones are cut in a second. Clarity, a lot of people focus a lot on clarity. I'm a graduate gemologist, I've studied this. I'm a professional. Let me tell you, people get too hung up on clarity. Um, you've often seen me when I'm on TV, I talk about my diamond ring, the VVS diamonds. Well, one of the diamonds is not VVS actually. Um, four of the diamonds are, one of them is an I1. And you look at it, to the human eye it looks the same. The clarity grade system goes from flawless, which means the stone has nothing. It's always measured under 10 power magnification. And it goes from flawless all the way down to I3. The human eye really doesn't begin to see an inclusion until you get to about an I1. That's where you begin to actually, with an unaided eye, you can see. I2, it's very evident. So for me and my own family and my own children, I told them when it comes time to get married to buy a diamond, honestly, I will go for a better color, a better cut, a bigger stone, and I will go for a lower clarity because you can't see the clarity. I mean, if you really need to be an expert and you need to use high magnification, it doesn't make that much of a difference because diamonds have such a high refractive index and are so dispersive that even a few inclusions, it can work around it, while other gemstones like tourmalines can't. But with diamonds, it's okay. So for me personally, my opinion, I would never buy for my family anything above an SI1. I just wouldn't bother. Unless it's for a giveaway price, I wouldn't bother. Color, very important. The only thing you can see is the cut, the quality of the cut, the size of the stone and the color. Color is very important. Diamond is an unusual stone because the more it doesn't have a color, the more valuable it is. So the color starts at D. Why is it A, B, and C, by the way? Because the term A, B, and C was so abused before GIA invented the system, they just stayed away from it. So it starts at D. So it goes D all the way down to Z. Well, D, E, F, the first three colors, nobody can tell the difference. I'll be, it's there. A gemologist can using a master set under the right lighting conditions when the stones are upside down. But for a regular human being, you can't tell the difference. We call that colorless. So they're beautiful stones, they have no color. Once you get to um, G, H, I, J, those are considered near colorless. They're very white. Once you get below J, that's the only time that you begin to see maybe a hint of darkness or of color uh, to a stone. So for the most part, most diamonds that are sold out there are near colorless. Um, as far as diamond treatments, when I began in this industry, there were no treatments to speak of. You could coat a diamond, which is basically painting it with a coating and bake it on to make it seem like another color, like a blue diamond or a pink diamond. Um, but recently, and I shouldn't say recently, I should say maybe in the past oh, 15 to 18 years, which I suppose is recent, um, there comes a treatment called HPHT, which is high pressure, high temperature, which basically means they subject the diamond crystals to very high pressure to a high, high heat. And what that does is that it removes some of the impurities from the stone because what causes color in a diamond? So when you have nitrogen, the diamond will appear to be more yellow. If it's boron, um, it'll appear to be more blue. Now it's funny then pink, there's chromium. It's funny, if a diamond has a bit of color, we don't like it, but once it goes down the scale, then it becomes a fancy color. So if a diamond has a lot of yellow, it looks like a yellow sapphire, then it's gorgeous and it's sold as a yellow diamond. They're beautiful. Those are called fancy color diamonds. Diamonds do occur in colors like purple and red. They're extremely rare and extremely expensive. Most of them that are, uh, that are like that in the market today have been irradiated, they've been artificially enhanced to look like that color, like the teal color diamonds and all the color diamonds, they've been treated to look like that color. Today, in today's world, almost all white diamonds that I know of, the vast majority have been treated using HPHT treatment to make them appear to be whiter. The treatment is permanent, it doesn't go away, and it lasts a lifetime. When I studied at GIA, diamonds are almost half our course. It's almost to become a gemologist, almost half your course is just diamonds. So there's a lot more that I can get into it, uh, but I don't want to keep these videos 
Honestly, two and three hours. I mean, I thought about showing you what it looks like inside and all the equipment, but um, I don't think you'd watch for that long. It really is a very complicated thing, but I love diamonds. They're beautiful. We sell diamonds. All the diamonds that we sell are, are in the near colorless category. They're about I1, I2, and you go to gemsonvogue.com, and they're all full cut. We have them for great prices. Everyone should own a diamond. I think it's just something that is, is, is great. Um, in my career, I started in my career selling diamonds. The second or third month that I was on television, believe it or not, I was on with the McCoys and I sold diamond jewelry, believe it or not. So I, I had a good career selling diamonds and I still do sell diamonds. They're great. They're beautiful. And um, it's a good time in the world now to buy diamonds because there's so much of it out there. Um, a lot of diamond prices aren't as expensive as they were, to be honest with you, compared to when I first started this business. I'm not talking about the big stones. I'm talking about the small the, with the melee. And that's a whole other thing. I can get into a whole conversation about, uh, about the various terms of diamonds. They can be cut into any shape, by the way, marquees, pear shape, round, oval. The more brilliant stone is always going to be your round stone, uh, though your princess cut can be very, very brilliant. That's a very, very big, big, brilliant stone. Now, that's not a diamond. That's a cubic zirconia. But cubic zirconia has a... Um, a refractive index and a dispersion, very similar to diamond, though it's nowhere near as durable, but it's an excellent diamond substitute. But diamonds can also be made by man. You've heard of lab-created diamonds, and using various techniques, which I won't get into this video because I want to keep it short, um, you can man-make a, a diamond, and it looks and feels and acts and thermal tests just like a, a natural diamond except, of course, it, it's made in the lab. But there's ways of telling because they grow very, very quickly in all this, but they're just as hard as a natural diamond. Um, and that's it for diamonds. Like I said in my mind, I'm spinning because I can go on and on about diamonds. Uh, there, you know, there's volumes on it that I've read. Uh, they're beautiful stones. Go to our website. We have great diamonds. We have great diamonds at great, great prices, but this is a small little snippet about diamonds, and I hope I've taught you something because they are the... Overall, the largest part of the jewelry industry. So enjoy your diamonds. Oh, by the way, before I go, diamonds have an affinity to grease. They will stick to grease like nothing else. So um, if you use hand cream like I do, you have to clean your diamonds. Diamonds can be cleaned with anything. You can use a harsh chemical with diamonds. So watch your skin, though. But the best thing to clean a diamond would be like an ammonia base cleaner, even soap and water will do, but if you don't clean your diamonds for a long period of time, that hand cream that you use is going to get stuck on the diamonds, and it's going to be kind of hard to get off, so uh, you might want to use something that has ammonia in it, and uh, Windex works very fine, by the way, to clean your diamonds, so um, always clean your diamond jewelry, because they'll sparkle and look great for a lifetime, and that's it, thank you very much for joining me, and I hope I taught you something great about diamonds.